Hello everyone, welcome to today's webinar from the Refugee Studies Centre at the University of Oxford. I'm Dr. Anne Irfan, I'm a departmental lecturer here at the Refugee Studies Centre and I'm really pleased to be convening the series this term where we look at the theme of refugee histories in the Global South. Tonight we have the third session in this series and we are particularly lucky to be joined by not one but two Leading historians in this field, we have Dr. Malika Rahal and Dr. Benjamin thomas Wright, who will be presenting their joint work on the international refugee regime and post-colonial sovereignty, Algeria Refugees and the UNHCR from 1954 to 1963. To tell you a little bit about our speakers, Malika Rahal is a historian at the Institut d'Histoire du Temps Présent in Paris. She is in charge of the Institute's scientific project. As a historian of the contemporary Maghreb, she focuses on present time histories of Algeria in the 20th century, and she is currently writing a popular history of the country's independence. Benjamin Thomas White teaches history as a senior lecturer at the University of Glasgow, where he is also a member of the Glasgow Refugee Asylum and Migration Network. He is a Middle East, Middle East historian by background, but now teaches refugee history more broadly and is researching the global history of the refugee camp at present. Dr. White is also co-convener of the new IHR series on doing refugee history alongside me and Dr. Laura Matakoro, who spoke in the very first session of this seminar series, which I believe some of you attended as well. Malika and Ben are going to speak for about 30 minutes and then we will have the remainder of the time for questions and discussion. A reminder that you can post your questions to both of them at any time in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom panel screen. Uh, you can start doing so from almost the beginning of their presentation, so don't hold back and that way we can hopefully get through as many questions as possible. That is all from me, so I will now hand over to Malika and Ben. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anne, and uh, I'm going to start us off with our talk on the international refugee regime and post-colonial sovereignty, Algeria, refugees and UNHCR, 1954 to 1963 or thereabouts, and I suddenly need to uh, get away from the full screen mode because I couldn't read my text. So, the Algerian War of Independence of 1954-62 to 62 was crucial for the extension of the modern international refugee regime beyond Europe. The 1951 UN Convention relating to the status of refugees had initially been understood as intended to settle Europeans still out of place after the Second World War. The mandate of UNHCR, the agency tasked with helping states to implement it, was set to run for only eight years. But two new population displacements in the 1950s brought about the expansion of its remit in both time and space. Within Europe, the arrival of tens of thousands of Hungarians fleeing Soviet repression in late autumn 1956 led Austria, newly independent after Nazi Anschluss and Allied occupation, to request UNHCR's assistance, first in providing relief, then in coordinating a mass evacuation. And at the same time, in North Africa, the arrival of tens of thousands of Algerians fleeing French repression led Morocco and Tunisia, newly independent from fr French colonial rule, to request the agency's help too. They were among only five states outside Europe to adhere to the convention before 1960. But the story of UNHCR's involvement in the Algerian war is more complex than this and less schematic. Today's talk starts with UNHCR's operations in Algeria before and during the war. And then we'll look at the experiences of the 300,000 or so refugees from Algeria who fled to Morocco and Tunisia and the way these states interacted with UNHCR. Next, we'll explore the much larger landscape of displacement those refugees returned to at the end of the war. And finally, we'll briefly discuss independent Algeria's interactions with the refugee regime immediately after 1962. Our argument across these different issues is that the Algerian war made the international refugee regime and refugees themselves into a site for the articulation of post-colonial sovereignty. 
So first, we're going to start with a fact that might sound a little bit surprising, that even before the war, uh, even before the war begun, uh, the 1951 convention already applied to the three countries under French uh, colonization, Algeria, Morocco, and Tunisia. That was because France had signed the convention in 1952, it had ratified the convention in 1954, but also because it had specified that its signature would apply to all territories for the international relations of which France was in fact responsible. Now that included Algeria, that was considered an integral part of France, in the form of a colony, but legally part of France. And that also included Morocco and Tunisia that were French protectorates until 1956 when they became independent. Uh, that meant that with different implementing uh, partners on the ground, if you'd like, UNHCR already had responsibility for in fact, two different groups of people. In Algeria itself, with the help of the French Red Cross, it was responsible for refugees that had been caused by previous wars. So you had, for example, a number of Spanish Republicans that had been refugees since 1939, and even some Russian refugees from the 1919-1921 civil war that were also present in Algeria. Just a note to say that this meant in 1962, when the French colonial st state was uh, collapsing, that the French Red Cross was pulling out and that very rapidly France considered that these old refugees, if you'd like, were now Algeria's responsibility as an independent state. What this also meant was that these refugees suddenly found themselves as refugees within the former colonized population rather than the former colonial population. And the colonized population was a much poorer population, which changed the level of support they uh, would expect uh, in independent Algeria. Um, the second group of people that uh, the UNHCR had responsibility over along this time, not with the French Red Cross, but with the League of Red Cross Societies and informally with the Algerian Red Crescent uh, was for the Algerian refugees that had fled Algeria to Morocco and Tunisia and that Ben is going to talk about now. Now uh, here the image is a map from 1916 uh, published in a brochure of the Algerian Red Crescent and reproduced in the League of Red Cross uh, Society's archives. It gives a number of about 200,000 refugees, of whom 100,000 were children, and in fact virtually all the refugees were children or women or elderly. And it shows that the refugees were settled in camps near the border. Many of them were close enough even to hear the war as it happened, like some Syrian refugees in Turkey and Jordan in our time. By the end of the war, it wasn't just 200,000, it was some 300,000 Algerian refugees were living in Morocco and Tunisia. And they were supported by UNHCR, but as Malika said, uh, UNHCR was not so active on the ground. This was before the UN Refugee Agency became a major humanitarian actor in its own right, which wasn't until the 1970s. So it's implementing partner on the ground for a vast joint relief operation was the League of Red Cross Societies, today's International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. The operation really got going in 1959 and it benefited from the publicity around World Refugee Year in 1960. It lasted until beyond independence into 1963. And the arrival and settlement of these Algerian refugees contributed to the process of post-colonial state formation in Morocco and Tunisia, both territorially and institutionally. It brought the state apparatus of the newly independent states into the border regions, supported by international humanitarian agencies, to count and map the refugees and verify their status. It also brought into sharper distinction the legal separation between the former French colonial populations of Moroccans, Algerians and Tunisians, now separate nationalities. For example, in Morocco, needy Moroccans tried to access the joint relief operation, which was only supposed to assist refugees. And so UNHCR and the League of Red Cross societies had to decide who was Algerian and a refugee and who was Moroccan or not. 
In Morocco, at least, the international assistance that refugees received put them in a better position than the poorest uh, members of the host society. And this is an issue that recurs in refugee history. It raised questions about the host state's responsibilities towards their own populations. Meanwhile, defining refugees also meant that nomadic populations in the border regions had to be assigned a national identity, according to which they either would or would not qualify for assistance. And this helps explain all of this confusion about who uh, qualified for assistance, helps explain why it was hard to number the refugees precisely. UNHCR typically recognized a smaller number than the, uh, the two host states. Tunisia, meanwhile, was wary about letting national agencies from other countries, so national Red Cross societies, for example, work on its soil, seeing this as a potential infringement of sovereignty, something that was new uh, and needed to be defended. We see that also historically in Turkey, for example. And then at the end of the war, the joint relief operation gave way to a massive and speedy repatriation organized by UNHCR and the League alongside the Algerian authorities and army in uh, uh, a situation that won't surprise anyone who's worked among uh, humanitarians and host states. There appears to have been competition over the branding of the operation between relief organizations and also vis-a-vis -vis the Algerian provisional government who was actually you know, assisting the refugees. About 200,000 of the refugees traveled across the border in only two months. We have some photos of the operation happening and this rapid repatriation had an impact uh, in all states concerned. It left Morocco and Tunisia suddenly under-supported. Uh, as I mentioned, they'd always claimed that there were somewhat more refugees uh, on their territories than UNHCR recognized, and they argued that they still required assistance with refugees that remained, but the relief operation swiftly wound down. A repatriation also left the refugees themselves under-supported. The humanitarians coordinated by UNHCR in Morocco and Tunisia provided departing refugees with tents for accommodation and rations. Medical staff stressed the importance of feeding them up before they left because there was great uncertainty about the situation they were returning to. Yeah, on this picture, for example, you have an image from uh, the repatriation operation in Oujda. The woman went goodbye to people who are on the train ready to enter Algeria. She's showing three fingers. We don't know whether this is a Moroccan woman or whether this is an Algerian woman waiting for her turn. Took a little digging to figure what the three fingers meant, meant the unity of the three North African countries. And so what she's waving is the fact that the third of these three countries had finally achieved independence and that there could be, uh, again, unity. So yes, the issue of, of how these refugees returned to Algeria uh, raises a number of very serious issues um, for all, all parties uh, involved. Here you have a map of the repatriation um, operation showing how it played out on both borders of Algeria uh, with Morocco on the one hand and Tunisia on the other. The first observation, if you look carefully, is how precisely the itineraries were drawn from city to city, from city to Morocco, to a city into Algeria, or for a city in Tunisia to uh, into Algeria. That was because what the refugees were crossing wasn't in fact just a line, uh, but was in fact a large swath of land. Um, and basically the refugees were crossing through a very vast minefield. Uh, there were 12 million mines uh, set by the French during the war. And what we have is, in fact, a very large borderland regions, region that was difficult to cross, but that was also impossible to live on in many situations and uh, hardly possible to, to uh, plow. Um, so this raises the question of where, in fact, were these refugees going to be installed and how were they going to be fed in this new independent uh, country? The other question, of course, is how to demine the region. 
Um, hence the repeated demands from the Algerians to France to hand over the maps of the minefields. Um, they were regularly rebuffed until they were handly, finally handed over in 2007. I kid you not. And the uh, demining operations thus ended in, in 2017, uh, so decades after the war actually ended. The second observation on this map is the fact that internal Algeria, so the, the, the region of, of northern Algeria where, where most of the population uh, is settled, was in fact divided up between various relief organization, organizations. This was taking place with the agreement of the Algerian authorities, and if you look carefully, it's a very light colored map, uh, the League of the Red Cross Societies was in charge of the two uh, borderland uh, regions. But everywhere, in fact, there were needy populations that were in dire need to be uh, fed, housed, and taken care of. And everywhere, in fact, the risk of considered to be great by all of these organizations. In fact, everywhere there were plenty of displaced people. The refugees weren't returning just to their homes, they were returning to a landscape of much larger population displacement. By the end of the war, it's considered that about 40% of the colonized population of Algeria had been forcefully displaced, about three and a half million people, and that a quarter of the colonized population had been forced into concentration camps, about 2.3 million inhabitants, that were dubbed camps de regroupement, regroupment camps, or regroupment villages, or sometimes just villages, um, that relate to other types of colonial concentration camps existing elsewhere uh, as well. Now, when the ceasefire was signed on March 19th, uh, 19, 1962, too, all of these people were free to go home if there was a home to go back to because there was a lot of destruction and in some cases people went home only to come back to the camp because the situation was less dramatic where they came from uh, than in the villages that they wanted to go back to. Obviously, at the same time as all of this, the bulk of the settler population was leaving the country. Um, we're speaking here about, a, about 650,000 people that left within the year 1962. Uh, that's out of a million uh, settlers living in Algeria before, uh, before the war, uh, and a lot more to leave in the coming years. So it's a whole situation of, of populations in uh, displacement or, or moving uh, situation. So really this begs for the question of how these refugees and the UNHCR would fit into this landscape of uh, displacement. Beginning in 1962, there's quite a significant um, focus of attention on the situation of the refugees. Here we see a newspaper from November 1962 announcing the beginning of the building, uh, house building operations for the refugees in order to uh, provide them with what is uh, needed. But at the same time, these refugees are lost, if you'd like, in a larger number of uh, urgent situation and urgent concerns that the country was facing at the time. Um, the humanitarian operations now folded these refugees, um, in some cases a little bit better nourished, better taken care of than the internal population of the country, folded them into the larger population of the needy uh, people in Algeria. And in the, for example, in the border areas that were uh, taken care of by the League, the League considered that it was about half of the population that was entirely dependent on uh, relief. Um, so the refugees is end up folding into this larger group of the regroupé, the people who had been forced into the uh, concentration or regroupment camps, um, and, and um, appear to be only one of the main concerns of the, the country. Like all of those displaced people, a lot of them ended up um, moving to the cities, so feeding into urban settlements, uh, which is very similar to other situations. This would be a decade later, the case, for example, um, during the Vietnam War. Uh, but the situation here depends very much on what the housing situation was like and what the camps had been built like during the war. And we're just going to look at three 
different pictures of these types of camps because I think they inform well on what will happen to them after independence. Here, for example, uh, in the east of the country, you have the type of camp that was built out of basically grass. Um, so a camp like this, once the population moves out, very rapidly disappears or, or dissolves into the landscape. Um, another type of regroupment camp is the type that was uh, built just outside of the cities. So here you have a camp near saint eugene close to Algiers. Um, these were built uh, in, in stronger uh, material and very often they were simply reused after independence, either by the people who lived in them during the war or by others who considered that this was better than nothing and who occupied the houses until they became part of a larger city. This one in particular, um, my husband and remembers very well from his childhood in the 70s. He knew this as a former camp de regroupement that was built into uh, the larger city. And a third case would have been um, the situation of camps that were entirely built by the French army. And in this case, things depend completely on what happened in 1962. In some situations, uh, people living in the camps destroyed them in 1962. They considered them to have been places of oppression, and so they destroyed the housing and reused the material. In some cases, they remained, and in some cases, they even begun became cities in their in their own rights, um, if you'd like. Um, so, so what we have here is a country that, upon independence. Um, is very much like an anthill of, of people on the move, very much uh, like Europe after 1945, uh, on a smaller scale though, as described by Modris uh, Eckstein, uh, an anthill of people uh, moving around, coming back, trying to go back to their villages and sometimes coming back to the to the camp uh, when this was possible, or people being replaced by others who were taking their place. Uh, as the war drew to a close, humanitarian organizations were still involved in bringing relief to all the needy refugees and Hugrupe alike within Algeria, as Malika just said. Here there are images, the kind of image we see in uh, humanitarian archives and publicity throughout the 20th century and beyond of milk being distributed uh, and so on, food supplies being handed out. Um, what about independent Algeria's relations with the refugee regime? Given the enormous challenges that the new state faced at independence, establishing a steady institutional relationship with UNHCR was not the foreign ministry's main priority. In September 1962, the High Commissioner's departing representative in Algiers, John Kelly, reported to Geneva on a conversation with Monsieur Galal of uh, the Chief of Information in the Algerian Foreign Ministry, former ambassador of the provisional government in London. And Galal told him that no thought whatsoever had been given in the ministry to this question. It was just one of those matters about which they had no time to deal. No doubt it would come up in due course. They would be glad to know what other newly independent countries had done about such conventions, which had been ratified by the former imperial powers. However, he was sure that there would be no difficulty at all about UN conventions. A UNHCR was keen to see Algeria adhere to the convention, not least because the French Office for the Protection of Refugees and Stateless Persons, the OFPRA, had made clear that after the end of 1962, it would stop renewing the ID cards of the old refugees still living in Algeria. There'd been as many as 18,000 old refugees in Algeria before the war, so uh, perhaps the largest number of Spanish Republican refugees from the late 30s, um, but others from many different countries. UNHCR thought that between two and 5,000 were still living there at the end of 1962, so after the war had ended and after much of the settler population had already left. And Algeria's adherence to the uh, Refugee Convention happened surprisingly quickly. By 1963, when Kelly's replacement, the Lebanese Michel Moussoli, was arguing that UNHCR should open an office in Algiers. This is partly because the 
new uh, Front de Libération National government had set up a refugee administration for the new state, which Mussolini felt would benefit from uh, advice and support from UNHCR. But it was also to reassure the remaining old refugees who were wary of the new government's intentions, for example, its plans to count them, which it did in 1963 and 64. And meanwhile, between 1963 and 67, Algeria also hosted a number of new refugees from violence in neighbouring Mali. And we would argue that like the governments of Morocco and Tunisia a few years earlier, the FLN government found interacting with the refugee, refugee regime offered a way to establish Algeria's credentials as an independent state, building on what were already long-standing efforts during the war to use diplomatic and humanitarian forums internationally to make itself into the recognized representative of the Algerian people. But independent Algeria's participation in the refugee regime also shows how deep was the French imprint on the new state's understanding of government. The administrative office they set up to support the implementation of the convention in Algeria was calqued on the Office, France, office Francais de Protection des Réfugiés et Apatrides, the OFPRA, and the OFPRA offered to train its personnel. So as well as being a turning point in the, in the history of the modern international refugee regime, the Algerian war is an exemplary case for understanding how that regime became an arena for the establishment of the post-colonial sovereignty. For Algerians, for instance, one of the dimensions of the revolution was actually regaining the ability to care for their own, or if you'd like, sovereignty over the Algerian bodies. This dimension was quite visible during 1962 as a whole, but during the repatriation operations in particular. Now, with this in mind, in mind humanitarian, humanitarian intervention questioned sovereignty understood as a sovereignty over uh, the, the body. Um, it questions uh, the limits of sovereignty. And if you look at the question of 1962, there's a clear tension, if you'd like, uh, for the Algerian authorities uh, between having to accept or even appealing to international relief on the one hand, and on the other hand, proving very defensive about their own capacity to feed, to protect, and to house their own people. And finally, outside Algeria, the war signals an important shift in the international refugee regime. As French colonies in North and then West Africa became independent and succeeded to the convention in the 50s and 60s, at first they followed France in keeping the geographical limitation. They would only recognize refugees displaced from Europe. But a number of them, as uh, my colleague Laura Madikoro has pointed out, then shifted to the alternative text that's available within the convention itself, uh, whereby states agree that they will remove that geographical limitation. They'll consider refugees uh, who've been displaced from anywhere. And a whole raft of former French colo uh, colonies as newly independent states in the 1960s, the mid 1960s, did that and thereby, I think, uh, created momentum towards the 1967 protocol, uh, whereby any future adherence to the convention would, uh, would lift that geographical limitation entirely. So there we are. And thank you. Okay, hey, thank you so much, Malika and Ben, for this really informative and illuminating paper. I'm sure we're going to have a lot to discuss 